When we hear another believer uh, share their burden, uh, a common response that we give is, well, I'll be praying. I'll be praying for you. But only we know whether or not we make a serious effort to actually pray for that person's situation and the things that they've shared with us. You would think that even missionaries, right, would be most serious about prayer. And certainly there are countless times when we've been overseas, been in situations where we have been completely dependent upon the Lord and for him to act in a situation. We felt our dependence upon him more living overseas than we certainly have in our home culture. And yet, embarrassingly, there have been numerous times when I've told somebody, I'll pray for you about that. And I can look up after two or three days and I have not actually prayed for that person. So what I find myself now doing more often than not is when someone shares a prayer request with me, I immediately either pray out loud for that person there or I'll just pray silently, silently in my own mind because we have the same father. We are brothers and sisters in Christ and I want to immediately take that burden and lift it up to the father. And we should request prayer from one another and we should pray for one another. And so this morning, as we begin to wrap up our sermon series on being resolved to do all things for the glory of God, we want to be a people who pray biblically, a people who are resolved to pray, to pray biblically. If you would, begin turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians is about three quarters of the way, I suppose, through your New Testament. It's after 1 Thessalonians, if that's a surprise to anybody. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And while you turn to 2 Thessalonians 3, I just want to share with you that my prayer for you this week has been that this topic, I mean, it is impossible to exhaust a topic like prayer in a 40-minute sermon. And my prayer has been that what it will do is it will spark a desire in you to search out the scriptures, to see if whether what I say is true or not, but to say also more of what the New Testament, Old Testament as well, says specifically about prayer. And that you will become a people who are resolved to pray biblically. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. And that we may be delivered and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So first I want to focus on the phrase, pray for us, that we find in verse number one. The word prayer, our English word prayer, comes from a Latin word. It comes down to us through Latin, meaning to request or to ask for something with an intense conviction. Biblical prayer certainly does include the idea of requesting something with intense conviction, but yet we know also that prayer, as described in the Bible, is more than just requesting something from God. Thinking of it simply, prayer can just be time set aside to speak with God, to commune with him. So when you set aside time to talk with God, you can set aside time to praise him for who he is, you can have time where you thank him for what he's done. You can have time when you confess your sin and you seek forgiveness from him. And you have time where you request, like what the, prayer, what the word prayer comes from. Right? Prayer is us communicating with God, and the focus of our communication can be various. And one of the most common questions that I want to address this morning when we talk about the topic of prayer is this. Why should we pray at all? If God is sovereign and all things are going to work out like he's already planned, why should we pray? Well, it's a good question, and I have a couple of answers that I'd like to think about from the Bible this morning. Number one, so we're under point number one, prayer requested. B, why should we pray? Number one, prayer was modeled by and commanded by Jesus. First, we see Jesus, the Son of God. He spent time in prayer. During his time on earth, he set aside time to pray and to commune with God the Father. It's God the Son speaking to God the Father, right? This alone should be a reason enough for us to pray. It was modeled to us by the Son. But then secondly, we read in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And then third, he even told his disciples in John chapter 14, when you pray, you pray in my name. So he modeled to his disciples, he commanded, his, he taught his disciples, and then said, when you pray, 
the expectation is that we will pray. But there's another aspect, number two, that prayer demonstrates dependence. There is another aspect that I want you to consider this morning, and it's the same type of question that we could think of when you think about prayer and why should we pray at all, the same question can be asked of praise. Why do we praise God at all? Right? Why do we spend time telling him or singing to him in our finite human language that is barely able to describe how awesomely glorious he truly is? Is it for God's sake that we praise him as though he is some kind of unconfident being who needs our affirmation and to feel like that we really care about him? Of course not. That's not why we praise God. We praise him because our praise overflows from a heart of joy in him. When I eat my wife's German chocolate cake, there's a lot of joy in my heart. It overflows in praise to my wife. My wife already knows, my wife isn't here this morning yet. My wife, uh, my daughter is at a camp this morning, so she's not here, so I can talk about my wife when she's not here, I suppose. She may be listening now, hi honey. Right? She doesn't need me to tell her because she already knows how awesome her German chocolate cake already is. She makes it once, twice a year. It's the most fantastic thing ever. Right? But I tell her how good it is out of the joy that I have in what she's done. And it strengthens our relationship. And in the same way when I pray, right, prayer is a conversation out of my relationship with God. When I pray, I'm acknowledging my complete dependence upon him. And at the same time, I honor him as God. I don't pray to my wife. I don't pray to any other human being that I have a relationship. I pray to God. Why? Because I'm completely dependent upon him for everything in life. I don't pray because God needs me. I pray because of me. I pray because my relationship with him. I pray because I'm needy. I pray because I'm joyful. I pray because I'm thankful. I've sinned. I need to confess I need to request things. It flows out of my relationship with him. And then on the other hand, there is a great mystery, right? Thinking about prayer as being part of God's sovereign plan. There is a great mystery in prayer that I also want to address, and it is this, that God has actually chosen for prayer to be a means by which his will comes about. The Bible affirms that God is sovereign over all things. Like, we cannot deny that. You read Isaiah chapter 46. He is sovereign over all things. Nothing happens outside of his plan. And the Bible also affirms, when you read James chapter 5, that prayer changes people and changes events. We read about Elijah there in James chapter 5, who was a righteous man and prayed, and it did not rain. God is sovereign, and prayer does not nudge God out of a laziness or a sleep to act on our behalf. I want to think about the question, how does prayer change people? Well, sometimes when we pray, I'm sure you have this experience, we find that it's actually our minds being changed as we pray. We end up praying, and our prayer brings us more in line with what God's will is, and the prayer changes people. It changes us. It changes our minds. There are times when we pray, when we pray that we, can, we find that prayer comes about that what we prayed for comes about just like we asked. And in that case, our hearts are full of joy to God for the way in which he worked. Sorry. After having five kids, I'm sure you realize this, like your reflexes get really fast because like baby's about to fall, you grab it, you know. If you were looking down and missed it, you can catch it on the video later on. Right? If you do not pray, right, the question is, Right, when we pray, God is honored and we are joyful. And if you do not pray, the question is, are you giving up joy in God? And I would say yes. You're giving up joy in God when you do not pray. It's out of your relationship with him that the joy overflows and prayer comes. But then if you do not pray and request, you're giving up joy. Certainly, God is not less honored in any way because he is God and is completely honored in the sense that he is completely glorious We don't add any glory to him, but he is less honored in your own life and in your own heart and in your relationship with him. So the first question, the first answer to the question of why should we pray at all? If God is sovereign over all things, the first, the first answer that we find is that we are, it's modeled to us. It's taught to us. It's commanded and exhorted by the son, the son of God, Jesus. The second response would be that we are dependent creatures. 
designed to find our greatest joy in God alone, and prayer shows our posture of dependence. The third response would be that prayer is a means that God has ordained to bring about his will, which is a great mystery to us. We pray to God not for his sake, but for ours. The mystery is that prayer is a means that God has ordained to, to, ch to change people and circumstances, and sometimes the person who's changed in prayer is you and me. Prayer is communicating with God, and in prayer, we come to know him more deeply and are changed by him. The last point I'd like to make, 1C, prayer requested, how should we pray? The last point that I want us to think about this morning is we need to pray biblically correct. That is, when we pray, we pray to the Father through the work of the Son in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit comes in to regenerate us and to make us born again. He gives us a new heart and a new mind and new affections to God. And when we pray, we need to keep in mind the specific role that each person in the Trinity plays in the part of salvation and the work in the world. So for example, when we praise, we need to be mindful of how we praise. We should not praise God the Father for rising from the dead after three days. And yet I've heard Numerous Christians over my 24, 25 years of being a believer, in their prayer time, they're praying, and it's, the, it's a bit of a mindless praying because they're praying or praising a, a, a person in the Trinity not according to what the biblical revelation is about that person in the Trinity. Yes, there was a resurrection, but it wasn't God the Father who rose from the dead. It was God the Son who rose from the dead. So if we're going to praise Jesus as the one who rose from the dead, well, let's praise him as the one who rose if we thank the Spirit, we can thank the Spirit for opening our blind eyes and giving us Godward affections. If we ask any specific person in the Trinity for anything, we need to keep in mind their specific role in the world and in salvation. If this requires a great familiarity with the Scriptures. You need to understand what does the Scriptures say about that particular person and their role. This point is not being nitpicky. I mean, some of you may be thinking, ah, when I pray, I just kind of pray, and it just kind of comes out how it's going to come out. But Jesus the Son actually told us, you pray to the Father, you pray in my name, right? That the Father may receive the glory. The Father instructed his disciples to pray in his name to the Father. So when I pray, I pray most often to God the Father. If, but if I ask the Spirit for something, well, what should I ask for? I can think about John chapter 16, verse 8, that says that the Spirit will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. So can I ask the Spirit to do these things? Yes. Why? Because these are his roles. So again, my general posture is to pray to God the Father unless there is a role-specific thanks or praise or request that I have. This is, what par this is part of what it means to pray biblically. We understand what prayer is, we understand why we pray, and we understand to whom we are praying. And again, I said this in the beginning, I hope that what this does is I hope it drives you to the Word this week to go, is Josh a little bit off or not? That's what I want it to do, and then I want it to drive you more toward being resolved to pray biblically. So what else does it mean to pray biblically? Well, one specific way is that we can pray the Bible. We're thinking about the idea of being resolved to pray biblically, and you go, well, sometimes I'm not sure how to pray, and I go, let me just open up the Word, and let me just see a passage like in Ephesians or Romans, and I'll just begin to pray that for myself or pray that for others. And so for the rest of our time this morning, I want us to look at second, the, the rest of Second Thessalonians chapter 3, because Paul says, pray for me in a particular way. So I want us to read again Second Thessalonians chapter 3. It's a short chapter. It's a little short passage, excuse me. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So the first thing we see here is that Paul asked the Christians in Thessalonica to pray that the word of the Lord would speed ahead. Pray that the word of the Lord would speed ahead. The word speed ahead here can just be simply translated as run. It's, the idea is to run toward a goal, to run a race, 
or just to run kind of in general. But it's the idea is that there is a purpose for the running. It's not the word jog because jog impl- you know, implies a more relaxed or casual feeling toward the activity. But the word run here implies actually an all-out effort toward a goal that's ahead of the running. So Paul's sentiment is clear then. Paul desires for something to run, to speed ahead. And what is that something? It is the word of the Lord. Well, what does the word of the Lord, the phrase, the word of the Lord, mean here? Well, in both the Old and New Testament, sometimes the phrase, the word of the Lord, refers to a divine revelation. Like we see that the word of the Lord came to such and such a prophet, and then he begins to speak, or whatever it says. It's just a divine revelation. But in the New Testament, the writers of the, in the New Testament most often refer to the word of the Lord as the gospel. That is, it refers to the message about the Lord or the word about the Lord. And we see this in Acts chapter 13, verses 48 through 49, which says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many were appointed to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So the word of the Lord here, the phrase the word of the Lord, refers to the gospel message, the good news about Jesus that we must believe in and be saved. And this is what Paul wants to run, not to jog, but to run ahead and speed ahead towards a goal. But what is the goal? If the gospel is going to speed ahead here, what is Paul's aim? What is the, go- what is the, what is the gospel running toward? Well, let's look at the next three words here in chapter number one. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Paul asked the church in Thessalonica to pray, not just that the gospel would run ahead, but that it would have the goal and purpose of being honored. When you read the books of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, you you will see that Paul has a fond affection for the church in Thessalonica. Why is that? Why is his affection so, so strong for them? Well, from Acts chapter 17 verses 1 through 4, we read the account of when Paul and Silas were there in Thessalonica preaching the gospel. It says, well, when they, Paul and Silas, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. As did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So we see the response there in Thessalonica. Paul preaches the gospel. People come to believe. Not a few few Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Which means a lot of. So Paul says that, excuse me, in 1 Thessalonians 1. Paul says that in spite of severe persecution, the Thessalonians welcomed the message with joy and that as a result, their faith became an example to believers across a huge area of Greece. In 1 Thessalonians 2, the very next chapter, Paul says the Thessalonians received the word of God and welcomed it not as, they welcomed it as it truly is, not as a human message, but as the word of God. So that's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, it says that for what, excuse me, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory, glory and our joy. What does it mean then for the message of the Lord to run and be honored, to speed ahead and to be honored? Well, it's obvious that the church in Thessalonica, they had they understood the goal because they had personally experienced what it meant to honor the message about the Lord. They welcomed the message as the very words of God, and they believed under severe persecution. The testimony of their believing spread across a huge area. The word of the Lord ran to the Thessalonians, and the goal of the being honored was on display, on full display among them. So who else better to pray for Paul in this way? Paul's requesting prayer that the word of the Lord would speed ahead and be honored from the very people who experienced what happened in their own lives. Paul's desire was to make the gospel known clearly, to make it known thoroughly, and to make it known in places where it had never been preached. His life's purpose was to preach the gospel in season and out of season when it was convenient and not convenient, and especially to go on to the places that had not yet heard the gospel. 
But he also desired for the gospel to be honored, not just for the gospel to go forth, but for people to believe. And to believe in such a way that it was impactful on them and their communities. And communities that were far from them because of what was happening in their own community. And so he asked the church in Thessalonica to pray for him to that end. So here's my question for you this morning. One of my first questions, I guess. Do you pray for yourself to that end? Do you pray for your church to that end? It's like, to what end, Joshua, are we talking about? That the word of the Lord right, would speed ahead and be honored. Right? Do you pray that the gospel would run here in Windsor and be honored? Do you pray that the word of the Lord, the message about the gospel, would run ahead in Connecticut, would speed ahead and be honored in this place, in New England, or in Cameroon, like we prayed about this morning with the Vegas? Or is your paradigm such that you believe the ground is kind of hard in Connecticut? It's kind of hard in New England, and that the church is always going to kind of remain small because people don't really care so much about the gospel. I don't mean the Christ Proclamation Church will remain small, but that the Big C Church, the Church of Jesus Christ, will remain small. No. If we're going to be a church-planting church, we need to make this prayer one of our more fundamental prayers. God, we pray that the gospel message would run in an all-out effort and would reach the goal of being honored in this town and in this state and in this region. Your desire is that none should perish but all come to repentance. But what we see is apathy and even hostility toward the gospel. So would you please, for your name's sake, so that the son's sacrifice would be honored, create a spiritual dissatisfaction in the people around me and in this place so that they may seek you. And then we pray that your servants would be faithful to preach the gospel message and that the gospel would be honored. Beloved, let us be a people who prays like that for ourselves and for our church. Let's pray that the gospel would speed ahead and be honored here in this place and across New England. So Paul asked them to pray that the message would speed ahead and be honored. And then Paul asked for prayer for a second thing here, a second item. So he prays, he asked them to pray that the messenger would be delivered. Let's read verse number two again. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. So point number three, prayer for the messenger. There are many examples that we can point to in the Bible of God's messengers being delivered. We we can think back to Acts chapter four, where Peter and John were brought before the religious leaders. They were warned and then they were let go. And in the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 5, the apostles were arrested again. And during the night, an angel of the Lord freed them from prison. And they went back to the temple to continue to preach the gospel. But they were rearrested and they were beaten. And then they were let go. Excuse me. Yes, and they were let go. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul tells us that when he was in the city of Damascus, the governor of the area was trying to seize Paul. He put the whole city on lockdown, but Paul escaped through a window in the wall. There are many examples that we can read of immediate deliverance from God, by God's messengers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8-11, through 11, we read this from Paul. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted to us through the prayers of many. So, Paul felt like he was on the verge of dying, and God delivered him. He trusted God to deliver him in the future. And verse number 11 is so helpful for our passage today. It says, you must also, you also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf. You see, Paul was confident. He was both confident in God's deliverance, and he was asking for prayer to be delivered. Why? Because the hearts of those who pray 
would be full of thanks for God's deliverance. We read the same sentiment in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. There is something about prayer that God uses to deliver, and deliverance happens as a result of God's sovereign hand in the situation. So we have to ask the question, is deliverance always assured? We read about all these examples. We can read about uh, what happened to all the apostles. But is deliverance always assured? Are God's messengers always promised protection from evil people? Well, the answer is no. God's messengers, messengers are not always delivered. And I wanted to point to three examples of when God's messengers are not delivered so we can see a few. Number one, we think about Matthew chapter 14 and John the Baptist. Right, pulled out of his cell after being arrested and beheaded. Uh, the scriptures don't say, do not say this, but I, I have, in my mind, I, I don't see John the Baptist being pulled out of the cell, someone explaining to him the whole situation about the daughter dancing in front of the king and him being explained, sorry, you're going to lose your head now because he, I think he was just dragged out of his cell, didn't know what was happening, and he was beheaded. You think about James, the brother of John, in Acts chapter 12 when King Herod killed him with the sword. That is, he was also beheaded. But I want to look at another passage with you. If you'll just hold your place there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and if you'll flip to Revelation, the book of Revelation chapter 13. Sometimes it's a bit of a surprise to be having a pastor go to the book of Revelation because it's a bit, it could be a bit dicey sometimes about what exactly Revelation says. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 13. There's a lot of things here I can't explain, but I do want us to look at verses 5 through 10. Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 10. And we're thinking about the idea that there's not going to be immediate deliverance for God's messengers. Verse number 5, And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty, and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority. Right, that's a passive verb. It was allowed. What if you think about it? it was allowed by whom? Well, by God. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Verse number seven, and it was allowed to make war on the saints and to what? and to conquer them. And authority was given to it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of, the, book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Right? Focus here is what it's saying. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Verse number 10, if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he will be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Even towards the end, deliverance from evil people is not always guaranteed. And this idea of immediately not being delivered from a situation is challenging for some Christians. Whether it be uh, because of we read books or movies when we read those things, we kind of see ourselves as the character who is making it to the end. We kind of see ourselves as the music kind of fades and kind of fades to black, and we see ourselves finishing whatever movie or story we're reading. We don't see ourselves like, you know, in the Chronicles of Narnia, being one of the Narnians in the battle who gets attacked and mauled and beat, you know, eaten by a bear, right? We don't see, oh, that's kind of the end of my story. I'll just be dead in the battlefield, eaten by a bear. We th always think of ourselves as the one who make it to the end. But this is not reality. Immediate deliverance is not guaranteed for every believer. And if we believe that it is guaranteed, then first I would say that we don't believe what God's word says about what's going to happen to those who follow Christ, which is that many will be persecuted and martyred for their faith. Second, we will have wrong expectations. We will be frustrated with God when we experience and ultimately succumb to difficult circumstances. You can read story after story about Christians in the past who were drug out and, to be careful here, who were drug out, tied to a pole, and lit on fire, and they burned for the glory of God at the end of their life. 
Right? We would not call somebody like that who did that, uh, someone who is a conqueror, someone who was delivered there at the end. And if we believe that God is going to deliver us from every single circumstance and difficulty that we have, we're going to be frustrated with God, but I would argue that it's not big G God of the Bible. I would say it's a God, a small G God of your own making. We simply have to be careful about who we worship and make sure that it is according to what the Word of God says. So if immediate deliverance is not guaranteed, then why should we pray for deliverance at all? Why should we pray for, for, for deliverance from wicked and evil people? Well, I would give three reasons this morning why we should pray for deliverance. Number one, the first reason goes back to the introduction about prayer. That is, we join in helping those who are in trouble. 2 Corinthians 1.11 and Philippians 1.19 are very clear that when we pray, which is what Paul asked them to do, we join in those who are in trouble, and when they are delivered, what happens? We give thanks to God. We're dependent upon him anyway, and overflowing in joy in him, we give praise and thanks to him. But what if they aren't delivered, which is what we prayed for? Well, we can still praise God that he's working all things out for our good and for their good and for the glory of his name, since we can only see a sliver of a minuscule amount of what he's actually doing in the world. So the first reason why is we can join in with those who are in trouble. A second reason why we should pray is just for a practical purpose. Evil and wicked people oppose the gospel and try to stop it from running ahead and being honored. We see this again referenced in Acts chapter 17, right? This is 2 Thessalonians whenever Paul was there in Thessalonica, the Jews stirred up wicked men to form a mob. And Paul and Silas were immediately sent out of the city for their own safety. Paul and Silas had been delivered from wicked and evil people, and they ended up going to a town called Berea, where the people there received the word with eagerness. Praying for deliverance from wicked and evil people means that the gospel messengers can continue to go forth preaching the gospel. So that's the second reason why. The third reason why is what we recite from the Lord's Prayer each Sunday, right? We recite it every Sunday. And what does the Lord's Prayer say except, but deliver us from evil? This is how the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray and how he's taught us to pray. So we should pray for deliverance from wicked and evil people. And yet what we can say is this, even though immediate deliverance is not guaranteed, in an individual circumstance. Ultimate and final deliverance from evil is absolutely guaranteed. What is this guarantee based on? How do we know that we will ultimately be delivered from evil? Well, let's read again. It's a short passage. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 3, and you kind of hear it coming together. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as it happened among you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. Verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and he will guard you against the evil one. So the guarantee that we will ultimately and finally be delivered from evil is based first on the Lord's faithfulness. But the Lord is faithful. Faithfulness to whom or to what? Well, he's faithful to the Father. His faithfulness to himself and his own word. His faithfulness to his sheep. So practically, how does this work itself out? We say, okay, I based upon God's word. He is faithful to me. Ultimate deliverance from evil is guaranteed based on the faithfulness of Christ. How does it practically work itself out? We can see there in the phrase, he will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Establish you, there is an inward strengthening and establishing that happens. And he will guard you. That means there is an outward guarding that he provides for us. So first, the inner strengthening, the inward strengthening. We've been reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I want to read something from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3. We read this. We sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. 
that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. They had been taught they were destined for afflictions. Paul was concerned, did not want them to be moved by their afflictions. He wanted them to be established. So he sent Timothy there in order to do that. He sent him there for the explicit purpose of establishing them and exhorting them. So the church, the body of Christ, this is one of the primary means that God has is ordained for you to be strengthened against the evil one. The inward strengthening, the establishing that needs to happen happens, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's through your life group, whether it's through the encouragement that you hear through the message on Sundays, but the encouragement to fight the good fight of faith and to continue to run the race are important to us being strengthened. Receiving biblical teaching from the pulpit or from your life group are important to help you being established against the evil one. A second, but yet no, no less primary means is the word of God itself. Right? Daily reading, meditation, and memorization of God's word sanctifies us in the truth. It establishes us, establishes us inwardly. And then today's topic, right? No less primary than the church and God's word is prayer. Prayer is communing with God, talking with him, interacting with him. And so through regular daily prayer time, we are strengthened against the evil one. God has provided these means of grace, his body, the body of Christ, the word of God and prayer to strengthen us inwardly. And he also, though, guarantees or shows us that there is an outward guarding that the Father provides. In John chapter 17, we find in Jesus' prayer before he's crucified, and Jesus prays this in verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you, right, Jesus is talking to God the Father here, but that you keep them from the evil one. The word keep here means to guard or to protect or to watch over. Jesus prays for us that God the Father would watch over us and guard us from the evil one. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 30, 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. So the will of God is that Jesus should lose none of those believers that the Father has given him, but to raise them up on the last day, ultimately and finally defeating evil. And the Lord is faithful. He is faithful to himself. He is faithful to you. He is faithful to me. He is faithful to his sheep. And he has prayed for us that the Father would guard us. And he has told us that it is the will of God that Jesus should lose none of this, none of his own. So we can have great confidence in God the Father that he will guard us against the evil one and that ultimately we will be delivered from evil solely because his word tells us that is the case. And at the same time, right, there's an outward guarding that happens. There's an inward establishing or strengthening that God has provided for you as a means of grace to keep you and to protect you ultimately and finally from, from evil and to deliver you. So again, I want to ask the practical question, are you praying like this? Are you praying that faithful Christians, right, the men and women in your congregation, the men and women in your life group, are you praying for your elders? Are you praying for your pastors, the faithful missionaries that we read about each week? Right? Are you praying for them that they would be delivered from wicked and evil people so that the gospel may speed ahead and be honored? Oh, beloved, let us be faithful to pray in these ways that the Apostle Paul has, himself has asked for prayer. Because here in this passage, we can see a way that we can be resolved to pray biblically is to pray the Bible. And we can pray that the word of God would run and be honored here in Windsor, in Connecticut, in New England, and beyond. We can pray that our leaders would be delivered from wicked and evil people, that we would be delivered from wicked and evil people so that the gospel will continue to go forth. Will you pray with me this year in 2022 to this end? And will you pray with me right now to that end? Our Father, we pray 
that you would enable us and empower us and help us to be part of the means by which the gospel, the word about the Lord goes forth and it speeds ahead. It doesn't jog, it doesn't walk, it doesn't stand still, but it speeds ahead and is honored here in our community, in the communities that we live in and in Connecticut. You know there are numerous places without gospel preaching churches. And our desire to be a church planting church. Father, in a way that you are honored in places where you are currently not, Lord, we just pray to that end that the gospel would speed ahead and be honored. And during this process, we ultimately and finally depend upon your faithfulness to deliver us from evil. And we know that there are wicked and evil people who oppose the gospel. And between now and then, we pray for your deliverance, that the gospel would go forth in a powerful way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.